So this presentation I called why classicism is so great. So if anyone look on that building, I think you should see already why classicism is so great. And I think classicism is the most famous of all uh, classical styles, right? So today we're gonna talk about that and I uh, formed it into three groups of classicism. So the very standard one, and yeah, I will go through it uh, step by step and ex explain the different forms of classicism and also explain how in detail they are designed the building so this one is from early 20th century 1930s i will also talk about that later that's the palais de tokyo in paris but let's start at the beginning so every <coughs> classical building is based on the classic column systems right i explained that in another lecture so here are the five main ones in a abstract or you say like idealized form of robert chitham i explained it in another lecture too if you want to go deeper into that so the main three ones that everyone should know are in the center so doric ionic and corinthian but here it's already the romic doric order so how the romans uh, uh, did it and every um every column order starts with a with a measure here in the in the f in the in the beginning of the base the lower diameter this measurement here we call one so y i hope you can see my mouse in the doric order we call it one and then for the doric order it has a height like one to eight for the roman doric order and the ionic is more slim and so on so we we number everything based on this lower diameter and then the entablature here on top is usually an average like one fourth of the column height so the ionic one has a lower diameter of one here a height of nine so one to nine and then 2.25 is one fourth on top so that's and this these kind of columns are the, the basic here yeah, the systems for the arc the basic system for all classical buildings right so here we see a bit more order starting with the greek doric i said already the other slide showed the roman doric the greek is how the greek temples are built they are very like short so the lower diameter is here this one i believe has a height of one to three point five or something and um they become slimmer and slimmer this is already the greek uh, ionic here in the middle so you see they're already much slimmer than the and the doric but you see also the, var the va they vary so they're not all the same here not all the same height and um yeah every classicism goes back to the greek classic temples right so here's one i think in olymp that's not the Parthenon. i i think it's i think the one is in olymp so this is this classic perfect greek temple right this is a doric one you see the doric columns um from slimming it is probably one here one of these two and it's more slim than the very ancient one and um yeah you see this this kind of ideal greek architecture so that's not classicism that's the greek original architecture and these come become like an ideal and an often worshipped form of architecture so already the renaissance architecture between let's say 1500 and 1650 refer to that so they refer to the greek antique architecture but then interpreted it in their own way and classicism now i show different forms of classicism so this is around 1820 something i believe so that's in bavaria you see this looks pretty much like the greek temple so the classicism is the time from let's say 1770 we could say it starts until 1820 1830 maybe and then there's a revival um, uh, beginning of 20th century and even nowadays we find uh, forms of classicism so classicism mean going back to the greek original architecture that i've just shown in different ways yeah more or less abstract so the first group i'm talking about is the l it orientates very closely uh, at the greek architecture so you can see this is the valhalla in bavaria designed by leo von klenze same architect has also designed this building here that's the glyptothek in munich uh, uh, art museum it still exists pretty nice at the king square in munich and it's the same architect leo von klenze so you see he orientates very closely his buildings at the greek origin architects or the temples so here he used the ionic order right more slim and i find the the, the columns stand pretty close to each other but it's this temple motif in the center and then the the wing at the side for for the art museum so there's quite a gap in the height which points out the importance of the entrance porticos quite much and yeah you see for for the number so here's the lower diameter this one this is the basic for the whole uh the basic measurement for the whole 
um, Portico's facade and then this is looks even slimmer than 1 to 9 and here's the entablature looks also pretty slim so interpretation very close to the Greek <coughs> origin architecture one example another one great architect is uh, Karl Friedrich Schinkel S some people call it him call him the greatest German architect ever so he he worked for the Prussian king in Berlin so yeah he lived in, in Berlin his whole life and he has always a great interpretation it's it's he orientates his building sometime quite close at the Greek origin but then he always makes something new out of it so it's quite classical his building this is the museum on the museum island now it's called the old museum because it was the first one of course when it was built it was not called the old museum so it's it's a very classic appearance that's how it looks nowadays with ionic columns and just a long row so very very pure and and generous so very elegant building i like that very much uh, as you can see it still exists in the same form on the museum island and so Schinkel is an architect he orientates quite closely in some buildings and then uh, in some points you also have like uh, influence from the middle age or from other periods and he mixes that together like in his own creation always and they are always very unique and i find very elegant so shinkle architecture is really great in my opinion and this one i've shown in another presentation already the petit trianon in versailles this is in the park of the baroque castle versailles in, in near paris um, but this one is, is also a form of classicism, so it's also very pure and elegant. And also this one I would put in the group that orientates its design very closely at the Greek origin. So here you see a Corinthian order. This one is the, the main column. Uh, and tablature which looks also pretty, pretty slim. That's why the columns look so strong then. And a very classic elegant arrangement of windows. Probably they have a proportion here of 1 to 2. But probably from here to here so the the white part comes in addition and it stands on on this this base in another uh, stone color so it looks very elegant and also this one is a kind of a unique architecture right they didn't build like this in, in Greek and the Greek classic architecture but it orientates very closely at the Greek proportion so I would call it like a yeah classic classicistic building and this is another example for or the first group although the architect is famous for being part of the second group so this is built by Boulet, Jean-Étienne Boulet. he is famous for a very very radical architecture that i will show soon in the next slides but this is one of the few real buildings he built so built by Boulet in france um it was called hotel something now i forgot the name but as you can see it's it's pretty well remained so ionic columns in the center here they are kind of part of the the um the porticos as well then tablature is, is this part right very classic and pure not much design and then very high balustrade on top th which gives it like a massive um, a massive appearance of course the, the steel was added later and then a mozart roof on top so overall like a very pure and classicistic design and because it's so pure and simple you see there's not much orient uh, decoration on the on the on the surfaces here so it's pretty empty except of this ornament around the oval windows here on the second floor so it's it's a very pure and yeah very elegant design in my opinion which or as i said orientates closely in the proportion of the greek architecture so very classical and classicistic but you see the the ionic columns he also did it like the capital like the previous one with uh, uh, not with a flat one but with the, with the ones around the corner they also had it in greek like this but since manierism i think michelangelo was at, at least michelangelo did famous ones around 1550 so he he orientates and, and that role model and and they are quite abstract as you can see so not so much detailing in the capital as well so the whole thing is quite abstract and yeah very pure in my opinion and a similar one was this is designed by Ledoux another architect so here we only unfortunately only the drawings remained this was destroyed not too long time ago I think like 100 years ago or something it was destroyed um, another architect from the same time around 1800 or a bit before I believe maybe 1780 um, must be shortly before the French Revolution so also this one orientates in the proportion closely at the greek classic architecture but you see it's very pure also so very massive here the ionic columns the entablature here on top 
with this very strong um, yeah th this kind of uh, how do you say roof like zims here and then this big base on top so this looks also very massive and representative but it's actually quite simple when you analyze it like only the columns this rustica facade and it orientates closely as well in the Greek proportion and in a very simple way this kind of freestanding house so now we come to the second group that's the same architect the second group is uh, is more known as revolutionary architecture why because it's designed in France but actually shortly before the French Revolution so this one is a um, how it's called again I forgot the name it's in it still remain in, in Paris it is uh, built by Ledoux so <coughs> this architect worked actually for the king so it's called revolutionary architecture but actually it's a very abstract and pure form of classicism and it's already pretty modern so that's why I want to show show that this architecture let's say from 1770 until yeah around se 1790 so actually kind of stopped with the French Revolution because he worked for the king um, was actually already pretty modern in this this massive volumes right it's called revolutionary architecture or revolution architecture and it's real revolutionary but actually it's worked yeah for for the ancient regime so for the for the king not for the revolution itself so here you see this this very uh, abstract ar arrangement of volumes and also the columns here are already very abstract so this is already pretty much like 20 20th century architecture this is another design from this kind of second group boulet the one i talked about who did uh, the previous one with the, with the glaze and roof uh, in edition so this is a, a very massive, th these, these designs, uh, that's w w where um, Boulet is famous for. So this should be a church, I think. And as you see, can see, the designs are like massive. So human is like so small and they're, they're abstract. And he was an architect. He had an architect office in Paris, but actually I don't know what he did there most of the time because not many buildings are like um, known from him to be built. Mm, it's more his, his, his designs. And here you see already how how the column actually become from one element, right? Before in the Greek architectures was one column to like to like many, and it was it's more like a more like a cut out window. So it's already the ap architecture so abstract that the the facade, pure as it is, it's more like a volume, right? This kind of cross shape uh, uh, volume, and then the columns are mainly like forming like a cut out window space. So it's it's not really this kind of unique column that's added like at the Greek architecture or the Roman it's already like this is pretty much 20 20th century thinking so like people say Le Corbusier in 20th century he built up on this kind of design philosophy so it's just a pure geometric volume and so many columns that you can't count them anymore right and another example from an inside so it's really massive uh, but it's not just the size I mean what I really like is this kind of abstraction that so many columns become already like one area of like perforate column space so it's more like abstract areas and volumes here another one these these great drawings uh, that's that's how he's famous for so it's mainly the geometric volumes in its pure abstraction that's what they call revolutionary architecture as i said although it was done before the french revolution and another one I want to show is, is a famous architect who was the, that's Gilly. His name is Gilly, but actually he's German. He has French origin, but he was the teacher of Schinkel, the one I showed before, Karl Friedrich Schinkel. And he died, unfortunately, at the age, I think, of 28 or something, or pretty, pretty young or 30. So he was like, he learned in France <coughs> and there uh, he got in contact with this revolution architect, probably architecture and then he went back to Germany to Prussia and he got a position of a lecturer because his father was also a lecturer for architecture and he was one of the teacher of Schinkel so and this is a design here for a, um, a theater in Berlin and you see also these very abstract volumes this is already pretty much 20th century architecture and unfortunately never built but from him only like mainly sketches and design remained except one building which is pretty broken now so this is also between like revolutionary architecture and an abstract classicism and now we start with the third group so that's the, the the early 20th century classicism which is already so abstract that it overcome already the the rules from the greek architecture so you see here the the columns are not really columns are like like block with a very thin 
perforation here of, of like a pilaster. So this is a, a monument in France called American Monument. I think built 1937, I think, in the, the west of France. And it's already like, it's still like classicism, but I think in English God they call it cl stripped classicism in American English. So it's it's like a very pure form. And it's still li like these, this is the building from the Mussolini time in, in Italy. This is the University La Sapienza, I think built in the 20s or 30s under Mussolini. So that's also kind of classicistic, right, in, in this main appearance, but so abstract that you see already there's no, no column anymore, no proportion, right? It's just this kind of this kind of uh, block here with this very, this should be the entablature, right? And it still consists of like three parts. You see one is here, this should be the architrave, very thin. This is the, the free zone with the, with the letters in it, and then, then this very thin um, part on top. So this, this is the entablature part here. But you see in the proportion to the very high columns, it's like, it's just the, 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 the idea of classicism, but without the original proportion, right? But it looks great actually when you go there, it's in the middle of Rome, it's a university there. Yeah, another perspective. And also here you see the, the, the plain surfaces, it reminds a bit like, like Boulet, but as I said, this is 19, 1920s and 1930s, they built like that. So a very f abstract form of classicism. Another photo. And this one I showed uh, at the beginning, right? It's called Palais de Tokyo in Paris. That's also, I think, 1931. And surprisingly, it's built by a group of architects, so not just one architect. And um, the Palais de Tokyo is a museum, still exists now. And you see already the strength of classicism. So it's just this kind of the arrangement with, with the rows of columns and you see they are so slim also they don't follow anymore at all the Greek classic proportion but they still have this kind of um, and the, the plinter I don't know in English this, this kind of squared element on top and then this very thin entablature which consists more of l more or less of like yeah horizontal plates so it's like like very um, very thin entablature which forms the roof and then the very slim and also here is f it's totally straight without any entheses straight columns but in even as, as this abstract form the classicism like shows its strength right so we, with these stairs here it's i think it's a very elegant very elegant building i like that a lot and this is again you are a uh, quarter near rome built under mussolini you see the 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 ancient form of the arc but then here like staple to this kind of monument that's in the center of eur area in near rome so a new built area outside of rome so this of course should show the italian like italian architecture in a very abstract form strictly seen is also a form of classicism but already like pretty modern and yeah now come in the in the last group where i want to show how classicism can also actually design like normal houses so this is le doux again in paris a house in the countryside which is also pretty abstract so it, it more or less goes in the first group but I, I put it at the entrance to this kind of last group because you can see like see it's like like a pretty s it, it's a pretty simple normal small house so here the ionic order the entablature the balustrade on top and this rustica um, wall simple window proportion but I mean you can build a house like that today right I mean like a small house why, why do they have to look so ugly the house on the countryside that's also a simple house on the countryside like the family could live there right and that's what classicism is capable to do so that's in Hamburg that's uh, goes back to the design of Schinkel but then it was changed a lot so I wouldn't call this design of Schinkel anymore so you see this Greek classic porticus here and then a very pure villa in the, in the west of Hamburg and again this, this is also a classicistic building but without a lot of decoration stuff right so just a very pure facade but I just want to show like what classicism can do as well that's that's designed actually by Schinkel that's a palace uh, not palace it was built for the king but it's like like a summer house you know in near I think uh, in, in the west of Berlin designed by Schinkel for the um, Prussian king and it's pure classicism so you see this kind of very abstract uh, in the own interpretation I said Schinkel always does like own interpretations the columns here and in this pure box so this is also I think a great form of classicism where it shows like how you could design houses today right with a lot of uh, people say like classical architecture has a lot of decoration but actually not as you can see here so it's mainly the mainly the the proportion the arrangement of windows the symmetry 
the facade that really looks like on the on the on the perspector and this clear proportion of the windows you see one to two here and this is probably three to four proportion and this is this very elegant language for a yeah for a house so you you can actually like as i said build even a house nowadays like that and it would be still kind of modern but that's what i mean that's the power of classicism